Hello everybody and welcome to VASC AgeNet webinar one. My name is Dr Rachel Climey and I'm the chair of Working Group 5 within the European Cost Action VASC AgeNet. VASC AgeNet is a network of researchers from Europe, the US and Australia who are all working together in order to refine, harmonise and promote the use of vascular ageing measures in order to improve clinical practice and reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease globally. Working Group 5 is responsible for education and dissemination. Before we get started to today, I would just like to run over a few housekeeping points. Firstly, your microphone should be muted. If it's not, please make sure it is now. Secondly, there'll be 20 minutes following the presentation uh, for you to ask questions. In order to do so, you just need to click on the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen and I'll un unmute you so that you can ask a question. The webinar is being live streamed onto YouTube and also recorded and will be shared on our website following the webinar. You will only be identified as attending the webinar if you ask a question. Finally, we'll not be able to assist with any technical difficulties that occur throughout the webinar. So it is my great pleasure to host this webinar and to introduce our speaker, Professor Stéphane Laurent. Professor Laurent is Emeritus Professor of Pharmacology at the Paris Decay Medical School. He was head of the Department of Clinical Pharmacology at, in the Hôpital European Georges Pompidou Hospital in Paris uh, between 2008 and 18, and head of INSERM uh, Team 7 in the Paris Cardiovascular Research Centre between 2009 and 18. Professor Laurent has served as the President of the European Society of Hypertension, the President of the Artery Society, and the President of the French Society of Hypertension. He is the author of over 400 referenced articles and 20 book chapters, and has more than over 100,000 citations. His research interests are hypertension pathophysiology and management, uh, pharmacology of antihypertensive drugs, arterial stiffness, and vascular ageing. So thank you very much, Professor Laurent, for taking the time to speak to us today. I'll now ask you to sh share your slides and, and take over with the presentation. Hello, do you hear me? Hello, Rachel. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me and do you see me? How can I know that? Yes, I can hear you, Stefan. And we okay. can see your slides. And you see my slides? Correct, yeah. And, and, and you see my face too? Yes. Okay, because I do not see it, but I, I don't want, I don't dare to, to try again. Okay, if it, if it works, let's go on. So thank you, thank you very much, Rachel, for your kind invitation. Hello, uh, everybody. I am extremely pleased to be here with you uh, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are on the globe. It is also an honor for me to uh, give this first uh, webinar for the cost action that should be encouraged and which is a, a fantastic uh, action of, uh, of spreading information and gathering people. So my, my task today is to discuss with you uh, what is vascular aging, why should we care? You will see that I will not detail some uh, specific aspect like uh, uh, the, the measurement or uh, the, the treatment, because uh, you will um, have it uh, uh, detailed and uh, very well explained in, the, in a, this, this series of a webinar by Rosa Maria Bruno and uh, Peter Nielsen later on. So what I will do is I will uh, discuss with you the general concept of the vascular aging. So, uh, I would like to, yes, uh, these are my disclosures. So, what is vascular aging? Vascular aging, very simply, this is the aging of vascular function in response to the age induced damage of the arterial wall. So, there is a kind of functional aspect and a kind of structural aspect but it also depends on the heterogeneity of the arterial wall. And you know very well that uh, uh, we should oppose large and small arteries. 
and the large elastic arteries are predominantly elastic and then downstream more muscular and the small size muscular arteries encompasses microcirculation which are clearly muscular the first one of a function of a conduction and compliance and the second one as a function of uh, tissue oxygen perfusion and this is a major site for blood pressure regulation through vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So if we oppose these large and small artery, clearly you see that all characteristics are opposed. First, large have thick wall because they need to be resistant to rupture, but also compliant for insurance, in ensuring the dampening uh, capacity and they have a large lumen, which is pulsatile. And then the resistance artery are small, they are thin wall. You see on the bottom, uh, one or two layer of vascular smooth muscle cell plus endothelial cells, and a small lumen, which makes very important the poiseuil low, because uh, as soon as you have a constriction, even small, you have an increase in the resistance. If you continue, Opposing small and large, the compliance arteries generate pulse pressure, as I will explain to you, but also they are impacted by pulse pressure and their function is impedance. What is impedance? This is a resistance to the pulse time flow. By contrast, the resistance arteries are the site of wave reflections and they have a function of resistance, as I said before. So finally, you see here that the site of arteriosclerosis that we will discuss this uh, uh, now uh, with aging, hypertension, uh, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. This is compliance. This is the large arteries. There is quite no arteriosclerosis at the site of resistance artery, but mainly remodeling, and we will see how it can enter into a vicious circle. There is no atherosclerosis. So clearly, what we will focus on now is the large arteries. This is the first general idea. The second general idea is that if we talk about vascular aging, that means that we would like to protect the vessel wall. And I put on purpose a lot of uh, beautiful images of uh, people of different uh, nationality, uh, part of the globe and age, to show you that uh, finally, healthy vascular aging, this is a life core strategy of vascular protection that should start in childhood and or early adulthood. We will have not much time to discuss that, but please keep it in mind. But clearly, all what we are doing, doing research, doing clinical research, uh, working on pharmacological targets, is to ensure uh, vascular protection all along the life. So remember a life course strategy. Now, if you plot on this uh, figure on the ordinate, the arterial wall damage from low to very high and abscissa the life course, what we see with, this is a, a pure uh, uh, scheme, uh, what you see is that even if you are in a perfect healthy conditions for vascular aging, there, still, there is still arterial wall damage. Our whole body is aging and the vascular wall is aging too. But we should keep this slope as low as possible. This is healthy vascular aging. So now, why should we care? For at least three, four major reasons. The first one is that we should be able by measuring arterial wall damage to detect patient that we named EVA for early vascular aging. This wording was coined by Peter Nielsen and developed by uh, good friends uh, like uh, uh, Pierre Bouturi, uh, Pedro Cunha, Empar Lorbe, uh, myself, uh, uh, Michael Olsen. And you see on the bottom, on the right, a book that we wrote uh, uh, five years ago uh, discussing all these uh, various aspects. So early vascular aging, this is the general idea that for a given age, upon the effect of various cardiovascular factors, 
the arterial wall damage is much higher than expected for a given age. So you have an upward shift of the whole curve, but also the slope of the curve is much higher. And because the slope is higher, you will more quickly arrive, arrive at various endpoints like elevated L blood pressure, meaning sometimes hypertension, subclinical target organ damage, and mainly cardiovascular disease. And the problem is that if you age too quickly, you will have cardiovascular disease too early, too young. And here, this second point, there is an enormous uh, health expenditure problem. In uh, a few years ago, the European Innovation Partnership on Active and Healthy Aging uh, discussed the point that uh, finally the long-term care will be uh, uh, will cost uh, a double, uh, and aging has a major impact not only on the EU public and private spending, but it has an impact on our daily life, and it will be costly. So health expenditure are extremely important, and this is why we should find uh, uh, important uh, discovery, but also this is why uh, you, you could, if you do research, you could find good funding. Third one, therapeutic strategies exist for regressing EVA. Again, you recognize the, the figure, but uh, now you see that for uh, the curve representing arterial damage in patients with EVA, if you apply those measures that uh, Peter Nilsson, Pierre Bouture, and I named ADAM because we didn't want to leave EVA alone. ADAM stands for aggressive decrease of arteriosclerosis modifier. In the best of the case, you can uh, lower, you can low, uh, lower the, uh, the curve, but the curve will never uh, be uh, superimposable to the one of healthy vascular aging. If you start early in life, uh, a kind of period of early detection and treatment of the cardiovascular risk factors, you may hope for successful regression. And uh, you see that the novel curve under Adam strategy uh, is a very nice curve because you reduced a lot the risk of uh, elevated blood pressure, subclinical target organ damage, and cardiovascular disease. And the fourth idea is that even if you reduce to a lot, you will never overlap with the curve of healthy vascular aging. And this is what has been named residual risk. The definition of residual risk is the risk of cardiovascular events that persist despite treatment for or achievement of target for risk factors such as blood pressure, uh, glycemia, or cholesterol. So these for uh, major issues will be, except the economic one, will be discussed in my, in my talk. Uh, I will gradually go through these four major issues. The first one is relationship between vascular aging and arterial stiffening. The second one is the concept of arterial stiffness as a proxy of vascular aging. Then uh, we will enter a third player, central blood pressure, to explain the pathophysiology. And I will go back again to the residual risk at the end of my talk. So first, vascular aging, yes, but specifically arterial stiffening. And again, I show you this figure uh, that uh, the compliance function is uh, supported by large elastic arteries. What is arterial stiffness? Arterial stiffness, this is a lack of compliance functions. So you know, most of you know very well this slide. In systole, during the left ventricular ejection, a part of the uh, cardiac output is stored into the large proximal vessels. And uh, in diastole, when the heart valves are closed, our tick valves are closed, uh, the part by pure attraction elastic retraction, there is a, a move downward, the small arteries, <clears throat> and this part of the cardiac output, which has been stored, <clears throat> excuse me, 
in the aorta is released gently towards the uh, small arteries downstream. This is a very effective way to preserve the uh, small arteries of a high pulsatility, as we will see uh, later. And uh, from the energetic of the hemodynamic, it is extremely effective too. So now, if you replace arterial wall damage by arterial wall stiffening, you can apply exactly the same, uh, the, the, the same figure. <clears throat> the, in this figure, what you see is that um, during the life course, upon the effect of the uh, cardiovascular risk factors, you have an early vascular aging of the arterial wall, mainly through arterial stiffening. And during the rest of my talk, I will focus on arterial stiffening because this is, in my opinion, where most progress have been done. And you see here a number of, uh, on the bottom of the right, of paper that we wrote of this various concept. Why do we focus on arterial stiffness? Because, because first we know uh, a, a, a number of evidence concerning the pathophysiology and the cellular and molecular determinants. Uh, the determinants are not only those of age-induced arterial stiffening, but also those of cardiovascular risk factor-induced arterial stiffening. The first uh, main among the non-hemodynamic factors that you know well is the elastic breakdown and changes uh, in the extracellular matrix because uh, of the repeated pulsatility and a kind of a biomechanical fatigue. The second one, which is also very good, is the increased collagen content and density and fibrosis. And the third is the stiffness of the vascular smooth muscle cell and the cell matrix connection. So not only the cell matrix stiffness, but also the stiffness of the vascular smooth muscle cell. And also its three-dimensional organization. And you see here on this beautiful cartoon how uh, sophisticated are the relationship between smooth muscle cells and the collagen fibers that runs along the elastic lamella, but also the connection of the smooth muscle cells with the elastic lamella through a kind of a focal contact. I put on the uh, right, uh, on the left uh, top corner, uh, uh, histopathology of the, uh, the aorta, because you have to figure out that at the side of the aorta, there are 40 to 80 musculoelastic complex. And uh, the one musculoelastic complex is what you see in the cartoon. So, an extremely sophisticated design of this relationship between vascular smooth muscle cell and cell matrix connection. On the uh, elastin, which is uh, uh, the, uh, if I do not, yes, uh, you can see with my, my arrow, uh, on the, this uh, uh, elastin network uh, done by Alberto Avoglio uh, with the fractal analysis, as he was able to, to find. Uh, uh, you see the elastic lamella, you see also these uh, connection between two lamella. So a very sophisticated uh, organization. But in addition, there is uh, the possibility of calcification, of oxidative stress, of chronic low grade inflammation. You have also hemodynamic factors because you know well that when you load the stiff component of the arterial wall, you load first the elastin component, the wavy elastin fibers at low pressure, and then when pressure increase, you load the stiff component like collagen. So the distensibility curve shows that uh, as soon as you increase pressure, you reduce distensibility, so you increase stiffness. In that paper that we published a few years ago with uh, Patrick Lacolle, Veronique Renou, and Patrick Segers, you see that there is a number of pharmacological targets for arterial stiffening. These are candidates for stiffening, thus for finding new molecules for the stiffening. But we try to uh, organize them, uh, to rank them according to various uh, categories, matrix, 
hemodynamics, inflammation, contraction, mechanosensing, transcription, genetics, and epigenetics. So the real world is much more complex than the one that I discussed to, with you right now. Second, a very important thing is that we know how to measure aortic stiffness. Cortifemoral pulse wave velocity is the gold standard. You see here the foot to foot method that many of you know very well. Uh, and uh, if you are able to measure the pressure waveform at the site of the carotid uh, artery, if you are able to measure it at the site of the femoral artery and to detect uh, the foot of each pressure waveform uh, with your computer, you calculate the time delay between the two feet. And then uh, when you know the distance between the two measurement sites, you can calculate pulse wave velocity, which is the distance divided by the time delay. And for those who like mathematics, you see that this is the inverse of the square root of the change in volume, delta V, for a change in pressure, delta P, normalized by the volume, rho being the density of blood. So we wrote um, expert consensus documents more than 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, led by Luc van Bortel, uh, on the measurement of aortic stiffness in daily practice using carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. And I uh, uh, recommend you to, to, to go back to those papers. Finally, I will not discuss uh, the various methods, but I will show you that there are new technological developments. Uh, I named Generation 1.0, the complier, Sigmocor, cardiovascular engineering uh, uh, used by the Framingham Heart Study, the pulse pen, uh, the wall track system. Uh, usually what they use is two sites measurement with a manual handling of the probe, it's operator dependent, uh, but those pioneering um, uh, studies have showed a predictive value for cardiovascular disease, so extremely important uh, um, uh, technique. There is uh, a generation.2.0 uh, with the brachial ankle and the heart ankle uh, quite uh, classical, that could be also generation 1.0, but uh, uh, I put them in, in, in that category because they were semi-automated measurements and it is a, 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 an important advantage. The finger toe pop met, uh, arter, arteriograph and mobilograph, they are two one site measurement instead of two site. And with uh, um, improvement, uh, you can measure the femoral artery downstream, the groin area, which is important in some countries. And, uh, but also you should remember that, uh, for instance, with arteriograph and mobilograph, this is not measured, this is estimated aortic pulse wave velocity. So we gain in simplicity, rapidity, feasibility, patient acceptability, and uh, 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 very good agreement has been showed with the reference technique. And you can dream about the generation 3.0, the bathroom scale by, by Withings already exists for a very large population. The laser Doppler vibrometer is under uh, construction and uh, validation, but they're going very well. Uh, so now we are going to one site measurement. It's fully automated. It is for large uh, population, self measurements, robust, low cost, connected, but we need some, uh, some years uh, still to uh, uh, enter those measurements into pathophysiological studies and uh, um, uh, pharmacological studies. Now, the, the second issue that I would like to discuss with you is that, that finally, arterial stiffness, uh, because of its easiness from being measured, because of this pathophysiology, because of what we know, could be finally used as a proxy of vascular aging. What is a proxy? The, the general idea is in this uh, cartouche in yellow here. Uh, it's an integrator of all damages done to the arterial wall during previous years. Being an integrator, uh, arterial, arterial stiffness can reflect vascular aging. Vascular aging for that function of arterial dampening, the inverse being arterial stiffening. 
So whether it is measured as a pulse wave velocity or as carotid stiffness, the two uh, most important uh, measurement, uh, this is an integrator of all damages done in response either to well-identified cardiovascular risk factors, gender, blood pressure, lipids, smoking, diabetes, but also, uh, and here you have a good example with the reference value for arterial stiffness collaboration. In uh, coordinate, uh, you are ordinate, you have counted from our pulse wave velocity in abscissa, the age category. But again, third dimension, you have the number of risk factors. And you see here, for instance, that for a given age, 50 to 59, uh, the higher the number of risk factors, the higher the pulse wave velocity. You can roughly estimate that 1.5 meter per second of pulse wave velocity is the equivalent of 10 years of age. So you see that diabetes, which uh, raises the calcid femoral pulse wave velocity of about three meters per second is the equivalent of an early aging of 20 years, which is enormous. And finally, the damage can be done in response to poorly identified cardiovascular risk factors. And you see here that the well-known chronic low-grade inflammation, oxidative stress, high sympathetic nervous system activity, DNA damage, telomere shortening are also extremely important, low birth weight included in fetal programming and the notions of the genetics and the epigenetics. So, it is not surprising when you see all these evidence that aortic stiffness has demonstrated an independent predictive value for various outcomes in various populations. Various populations you see here on the left, from general population to a, a more uh, a focused population, like patients with chronic kidney disease or renal transplant recipient, and various outcomes from total mortality to coronary events to even onset of hypertension. And uh, you see here that it is an independent predictive value underlined in black. Independent means that the predictive value goes beyond the classical cardiovascular risk factor as you can uh, use them in uh, the European score or the Framingham risk score. Carlombos Vakopoulos, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, published that meta-analysis on the predictive value of aortic stiffness and you see here that for any increase in one standard deviation of aortic stiffness, you increase the risk by 50%, roughly 47 to 42 for total cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, and all cause mortality. And this is why the measurement of pulse has been included in the European guidelines, European Society of Cardiology and European Society of Hypertension. European guidelines for the management of arterial hypertension here, the 2018, but it was already included in the 2013. <clears throat> but now to better understand the, what is the, the, the true link, a uh, physiological link between arterial stiffness and cardiovascular event, we should enter a third player, which is central blood pressure. And uh, you know, that uh, brachial blood pressure does not reflect the central uh, or aortic blood pressure, that in healthy young people there is an amplification. Amplification means brachial minus aortic, so systolic blood pressure in healthy young people is increasing from the aorta to the brachial, but not diastolic. This is not the case in elderly patients where uh, both uh, systolic, aortic, and brachial uh, blood pressure are uh, quite the same. So you shouldn't be surprised that uh, these two blood pressure are not the same because look at where is measured the brachial blood pressure at the end of a long tube, the brachial artery connected to the central system. Uh, you have here the shape waveform uh, of the brachial uh, pressure and you have the waveform of the central blood pressure and clearly the um, uh, not the same. So central blood pressure <clears throat> in its shape, in its pulsatility is the, <coughs> excuse me, this is here, there is a main concept that finally central systolic and pulse pressure are the true pulsatile load 
damaging target organ. And this is why we should measure central rather uh, than only the brachial. And I can <coughs> and I can uh, with this small cartoon explain you uh, the a, a very important notion which is impedance mismatch. Uh, impedance mismatch and organ protection. How can you we view that uh, important pathophysiological aspect in young normotensic subject? The heart uh, ejects uh, the flow, rising blood pressure in an elastic from proximal aorta, then to a stiff abdominal aorta, then to the small arteries. This is a forward pressure wave. But you see here that. Uh, because of the elasticity of proximal aorta and the stiffness of the distal abdominal aorta and distal muscular artery, there is what is named high impedance mismatch, or if you will, a kind of uh, um, uh, arterial stiffness gradient. This mismatch gives rise to reflected pressure wave. Reflected pressure wave means reflected pulse style energy. So you can consider that it is a very effective protective mechanism that limits the transmission of pulsatility into the microcirculation. And we know that uh, pulsatility is not good. It has no impact on central blood pressure because the reflected pressure wave travels at a low speed. In elderly or hypertensive stiffness, uh, subjects, sorry, the proximal aorta becomes stiffer. So there is loss, less impedance mismatch less reflected pressure wave, less reflected pulse style energy, there's more transmission of pulsatility into the microcirculation. And because the reflected pressure wave travels at high velocity in the large arteries, the reflected pressure wave will arrive early in early systole, will superimpose on the forward wave and will elevate central systolic blood pressure. And this is typically isolated systolic hypertension pathophysiology. So in a summary, the predictive value for, of arterial stiffness for cardiovascular uh, events could start with arterial stiffness leading to less impedance mismatch, rising central systolic and pulse pressure, giving more transmission of pulsatility into the microcirculation and increasing target organ damage. And if this hypothesis is true, we should find a higher correlation with central than with peripheral blood pressure for target organ damage. And I will uh, rapidly show you uh, four slides uh, to give you evidence. And there is a number. I uh, put it only the reference of the pioneering studies. For instance, here, central pulse pressure is damaging the heart to a greater extent than peripheral pulse pressure for left ventricular hypertrophy, for left atria enlargement, a new onset of atrial fibrillation, for systolic dysfunction, for diastolic dysfunction. This is the, true also for the kidney, either in cross-sectional studies or in prospective studies in patients with mild to moderate CKD or patients with end-stage renal disease. And this is true also for the brain, uh, where central pulse pressure is damaging the brain to a greater extent than peripheral pulse pressure, and it has been showed with white matter lesion as a surrogate of um, uh, brain uh, damage. And finally, the arterial wall by itself, and here you have a review by uh, Mary Roman, uh, published um, uh, some years ago, if you used IMT or diameter of plaque, Again, central pulse pressure is more damaging than um, uh, peripheral blood pressure. So finally, there is a large amount of data indicating that central pulse pressure damages the heart, the kidney, the brain, the large and small arteries to a greater extent than peripheral pulse pressure. So the general scheme of uh, the uh, pathophysiological uh, link is now well, uh, well accepted. I will add two uh, degree of complexity. First, one that we named some years ago, about 10 years ago, the large small artery crosstalk. Uh, for instance, if you start with the structural alterations of small arteries on the top, 
uh, by the reduction in lumen diameter, you know that you will have an increase in resistance, then partial resistance, then increase in mean blood pressure, then increase in the loading of the stiff component of the large artery wall, meaning increased arterial stiffness in the bottom, and then on the left, increased central systolic blood pressure that in terms uh, induce eutrophic remodeling, so a, a type of a vicious circle. So it is uh, well illustrated uh, in, by many studies in uh, hypertension. In that paper, Rachel and uh, Rachel Klimi and Thomas and Rosa Maria uh, and the colleagues applied it uh, to uh, the uh, type 2 diabetes and hypertension story. And uh, by increasing the, the level of uh, complexity, but also the number of evidence, uh, they are able to show that finally arterial stiffness through this increase in pressure and flow pulsatility is a major determinant of microvascular dysfunction and damage. And in uh, organs with a high flow, low impedance microvasculature like the brain and the kidney, this is responsible for an important uh, uh, damage. Um, uh, and uh, uh, finally, this uh, vicious circle between uh, large and small arteries is continuously playing uh, an important uh, deleterious effect on the uh, uh, arterial structure and the, the pathophysiology. And finally, uh, I will uh, address uh, the issue of residual risk. You recognize that uh, um, figure, arterial stiffness, uh, ideally should increase the less possible during lifetime course in patients with healthy vascular aging. In patients with early vascular aging, the slope is uh, largely different, but can be reduced by an aggressive strategy. These strategies, this is mainly antihypertensive agents, but also anti-diabetic drugs, lipid-lowering drugs, and a number of drugs that should reduce cardiovascular risk. Uh, we have less evidence uh, for antiplatelet agents and anti-obesity drugs, but all of them uh, should be uh, studied on the on arterial stiffness. But look, even if it uh, is the, the, the modified curve uh, is lowered, it is different from the curve of the LC vascular aging. And uh, I suggest that this remaining arterial stiffness, uh, here this is a high arterial stiffness, uh, is the equivalent of a high residual risk. Remember, residual risk is the risk of cardiovascular events that persist despite treatment for or achievement of target for risk factors such as blood pressure, lipids, or glycemia control. So even if you do your best and your patient die, then do uh, the same, both physicians and patients. Uh, even if you uh, lower this uh, uh, curve of arterial stiffness uh, according to, uh, uh, to the time, uh, even if you have a low arterial stiffness, still it is not close to the healthy vascular aging. And there is a number of papers published uh, uh, some uh, 10, 15 years ago on, on that um, issue. So my suggestion is that should be uh, that that should express a low residual risk, and that you can understand what is a residual risk uh, if you integrate both classical cardiovascular factors and additional cardiovascular risk factors as the long time effect of those risk factor, because we know well the classical one age, gender, blood pressure, lipids, cholesterol, um, glycemia, obesity, good, but we do not know so well the additional cardiovascular risk factors. And I will suggest uh, uh, three categories quite quickly. First, the biological factors. We alluded to uh, when I talked about the, the proxy value of arterial stiffness. Chronic low grade inflammation, oxidative stress, increased sympathetic nervous activity, DNA damage, telomere shortening, low birth weight, genetics, epigenetics, fetal programming. Good. 
we have seen that. There is a second um, category that I uh, considered as measurable but poorly assessed. And you all, all of you, you know that high salt intake is extremely important. It's difficult to measure. There are uh, some quite few studies. We know more about gut microbiome composition, uh, less about inadequate diet. We know more about alcohol consumption. And finally, abnormal sleep pattern, thrombogenic factors, hormonal status, an, uh, an increasing number of studies. But there is a last category that uh, has retained finally quite few attention. And in my opinion, it is extremely important social inequality, social deprivation, perceived stress, income inequality. And for those who are inter interested in epidemiological studies, I think that there is uh, an, an, an important work to do there. And we are living uh, the COVID epidemics uh, right now. Uh, we will have a, a, a dramatic uh, reduction in the wealth of the, uh, of the world and uh, uh, economical problems and uh, we will increase the income inequalities and we should remember that that could affect uh, very well the, uh, uh, the cardiovascular risk and also the vascular aging. For instance, uh, I was absolutely uh, uh, interested by this uh, uh, study done in 23 countries of OECD uh, relating life expectancy to income inequality. And you see here that the higher the income inequality, the lower the life expectancy. This relationship has been repl replicated in 50 states of uh, America. The highest the income inequality, New York, Los Angeles. Um, uh, uh, this is not Los Angeles, this is uh, maybe Louisiana. Uh, and uh, on the ordinate, uh, uh, the low expectancy. So finally, if you combine all um, the letterous effect of income inequality, you see that uh, the consequences of uh, a huge income inequality are total mortality, mortality at birth, undesired pregnancy, perceived stress, social deprivation, depression, suicide, homicide, criminality, cardiovascular disease. They are all linked. This is not uh, uh, usually addressed in the various meetings, but I think it is uh, on a social aspect of our life, uh, an important uh, matter. And uh, most importantly, uh, it is not related to healthcare expenses. It is not related to the access to high technology medical care. One of the major factors is income inequality. And I could add in those social factors, uh, other important one like uh, patient's inertia, physician's inertia, etc. So it is now time to conclude, uh, to keep in time. What should we care about vascular aging? For a number of reasons. First, because vascular aging, this is a major concern of cardiovascular complications, not only in aging populations, but also throughout life. Second, vascular aging can be easily measured by arterial stiffness. Arterial stiffness is an independent factor for organ damage and could act in parallel with the increase in central blood pressure. Arterial stiffness has predictive value for cardiovascular events. Arterial de-stiffening can be obtained by a number of pharmacological agents and lifestyle modifications. And it can be obtained down to a certain value corresponding to the residual risk. And we have to work now in parallel with the classical cardiovascular risk factor to those factors of residual risk. And finally, the monitoring of arterial stiffness can help optim optimally treating patients, choosing the right drugs, improving adherence of patients uh, through a kind of a discussion about their value of pulse rate velocity. And with that, I will uh, uh, express my uh, grateful thanks to uh, the uh, COST uh, uh, committee, to Rachel for her kind invitation, and I will tell you please stay safe in this uh, epidemics uh, uh, period. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you for this um, wonderful overview of vascular aging. Um, if anyone has any questions now, please click on the raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen and I can unmute you so that you can ask your question. While people are doing that, I might ask the first question. Um, so you spoke about uh, arterial stiffness being a proxy for vascular aging. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on other um, biomarkers or um, uh, vascular markers that we measure, such as um, carotid IMT or distensibility or endothelial dysfunction, for example, as also a marker of vascular aging. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And this is what I tried to, uh, uh, differentiate in my in my uh, at the beginning of my talk, I I, I chose um, and I focused my talk on arterial stiffness because uh, this is what has been the most studied, uh, at least uh, uh, by my group, but also um, uh, uh, downstream to the, uh, uh, the the concept of surrogate endpoint. But you're right, uh, measuring carotid IMT, measuring carotid. Uh, I would prefer measuring carotid stiffness because uh, uh, carotid IMT, uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, meta regression analysis showing that finally, when you reduce carotid IMT, you do not reduce the risk. Uh, and it is a very important step. So carotid stiffness or carotid distensibility, as you wish, but uh, endothelial dysfunction, the problem with endothelial dysfunction that it's very much dependent on the type of apparatus that you use. Mm -hmm. Some uh, improved apparatus have been well developed uh, to get uh, some robust uh, data uh, and uh, repeatable measurements, but endothelial dysfunction, certainly. Okay, I'm just um, having a look, see if anyone's got any questions. Oh, we have... Uh, I see one. Yes. Um, Okay, so we have um, someone who's asking about the role of gas ex exchange abnormalities in patients with chronic respiratory problems in the relationship between arterial stiffness and increased pulsatility in the brain. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a very important question, quite uh, complex too. Uh, I do not know, uh, in my opinion, as well as the one who asked the question. <laughs> But uh, we have epidemiologic evidence relating arterial stiffness and uh, chronic um, pulmonary uh, disease. Uh, we have a relationship between uh, brain uh, damage, and I, I call it uh, the white matter lesion and arterial stiffness. Uh, there are good uh, relationship with uh, the, uh, uh, in, in that pathophysiological link, uh, there is an importance of the central blood pressure and the carotid pulse pressure. Uh, now, uh, about gas exchanges and uh, maybe the role of uh, uh, carotid chemoreceptors uh, or other uh, damages to the arterial wall, uh, for instance, uh, a kind of uh, oxidative stress, chronic uh, low-grade inflammation, uh, I do not know much, but I think this is worth, uh, worth, um, worth of investigation, certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here from Cheng Zhu who asked, um, <clears throat> is there a preferred preclinical model for vascular aging? Which preferred? Yes. Um, very good question. I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I, I will not give you uh, which one. I will not tell you which one because I think that those models are um, uh, in progress. Uh, we started for a year with uh, spontaneously hypertensive rats. Uh, there are other models of uh, uh, calcified uh, carotid artery in, in mice. Uh, there are models of uh, uh, calcified aorta with vitamin D uh, in rats. Uh, all, the, all those are quite uh, old models, but they gave uh, important uh, results. Uh, I think that with uh, knockout mice, uh, we can uh, learn a lot uh, and uh, mainly uh, knockout focusing on the uh, kind of molecular targets, those interesting molecular targets that I showed you in this beautiful tree with colors showing a number of uh, possible molecular uh, targets. Uh, so uh, uh, I think this is an important uh, topic and that we need uh, an easily accessible uh, 
a repeatable, robust animal model, if possible in mice, uh, to, to use knockout mice. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here. Um, is it necessary to measure arterial stiffness in childhood adolescence to prevent vascular aging later in life? Uh, I think, uh, I, I would say it is important. Uh, of course, we know that uh, arterial stiffness will be normal uh, in those who are uh, fit, who are exercising, who are uh, having uh, living in healthy conditions good but i think that it could raise attention to those who are not following those conditions to raise the attention to the uh, environment to, to the uh, parents to uh, the, uh, the the uh, uh, the community uh, to apply those uh, lifestyle measure and then if you go beyond those classical cardiovascular risk factor sedentarity uh, fat uh, diet, etc. Uh, maybe if you consider that uh, in an homogeneous population, there may be some genetic abnormality or genetic difference. So some uh, child, some children, some adolescents may not be exposed to the same uh, extent. And you may have a kind of excess vascular aging, an early vascular aging in childhood or in adolescence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Emperor Lourbe uh, and the other colleagues uh, uh, having a series of uh, uh, children and adolescents studied for pulse rate velocity and central blood pressure have showed that. And for instance, uh, epigenetics, you know that it is correlated with um, low birth weight. So, uh, uh, but we know that low birth weight exposed to more obesity uh, and uh, metabolic syndrome. So certainly worth uh, working on that aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here. You mentioned in the conclusion that monitoring arterial stiffness can improve patient health. With the low uptake of pulse wave velocity measurements in clinical settings, what are your thoughts on how we can help to change this? To change, uh, ah, uh, I do not understand exactly the question, how to, to change uh, the, the, the way we are doing, uh, we are routinely clinical, uh, um, um, following patients in clinical uh, uh, setting. Uh, if I understand correctly the question, uh, my idea it was that uh, you, you, when you have a robust measurement like that, if you can measure every year, it's not necessary to measure more often, every year in your patient, pulse wave velocity, after one or two years, you have a kind of evolution. And uh, it, with this a kind of monitoring, uh, you can uh, imply more deeper, uh, your, more deeply your patients into its uh, adherence, his or her adherence to treatment. Uh, you show the curve. I've done that all my life. Uh, for the last 40 years, I measured uh, pulse wave velocity in quite all the patients of my outpatient clinic. And uh, when I see one patient in consultation, I have uh, the last uh, uh, five to uh, 20 uh, uh, measurements, yearly measurements. And I can tell you that when you show the numbers to the patients and when you tell him or her, look, uh, you started with 14 and thanks to your good observance, adherence to treatment uh, and compliance to uh, my recommendations, you were able to reduce to 12 and 10. And we know that it means in terms of reduction of risk. It is hypothetical. It has never been proved. The SPART study that we are conducting intends to prove that, that if you reduce pulse wave velocity, you will reduce the risk. But at least there are uh, an, a number of indirect arguments to convince patients. And when they see the number, they see that their blood pressure didn't change. They see that. Uh, but the, the, the cholesterol may have been proved that their weight has been reduced. It's, I think it's a very good incentive for them to, to, to follow uh, their treatment. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Um, so one more. Um, someone is wondering about how to quantify the residual risk and how to lower the risk. It feels uh, like the risk factors are confounded by many things. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right, uh, absolutely right. And this is why it is uh, such a complex uh, uh, issue. Um, uh, but I think also that we do not have enough uh, epidemiological studies. So uh, maybe uh, with multivariate analysis, maybe with uh, a number of uh, uh, novel parameters or sophisticated parameters at the beginning and then more simple one at the end uh, uh, related to this uh, additional cardiovascular risk factor, we could see uh, much better. But uh, look, uh, the Ferguson paper that I showed uh, 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 related the, the income inequality to uh, cardiovascular risk but it was not modified by the healthcare expenditure. It was not modified by the access to technology. When you do correctly a good epidemiological study with a good multivariate analysis, finally, you can individualize what is the most important. So uh, just to call your attention that social, that you should not neglect social factors, even if social factors means uh, uh, more access to fat diet, yes, more access to sedentarity, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, so there has been some talk about the point where vascular aging or stiffening becomes irreversible. How much of vascular aging do you think is actually reversible? And is there a way to determine how much can be reversed in a patient in the clinic? Excellent question. I'm so happy to have all uh, so many excellent questions, but you know. <laughs> Each one can give rise to a thesis program, PhD program. Uh, uh, the, the, how much uh, can we uh, regress and uh, down to which value can we regress? Uh, I do not know. I do not know. What I know is that uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when we started to see uh, the value uh, of, uh, to, to study the value of uh, pulse wave velocity, in uh, never treated hypertensive patients, in uh, long term well controlled hypertensive patients, and in uh, uh, healthy patients, what we saw was that even in well controlled uh, uh, hypertensive patients, well treated, well adherent to their treatment, the value never uh, went down to the value of healthy control. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how to how to to quantify uh, maybe by uh, looking at the value of your patients and compare it to the same uh, patient uh, considered as healthy. Good, this is one possibility. And also with a good contact and uh, by a good uh, inquiry of all possible factors that could explain the difference. But certainly we need epidemiological studies, pathophysiological studies again. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are your thoughts on the correlation between cellular science markers in vascular aging? Um, cellular senescence markers are absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, in my opinion, this is more for basic research. We can learn a lot from senescence marker. Uh, this is the beauty of the basic research during the last, uh, let's say, 20 years. Um, if we could have cell senescence markers available uh, for clinic or for clinical research, I do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I am too naive in that domain, certainly I am. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, but also in animal models, and we were talking about animal models, but uh, certainly all what I discussed should be related to, cellu to cellular senescence marker. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, probably the last question now, because we've um, reached one hour. So um, to what extent does regular exercise mitigate vascular aging? For example, is it a linear increase with the amount of physical activity? Physical exercise, I am not the expert. You are the expert, Rachel and many others are experts in that domain. Uh, I would say it's a complicated matter because what uh, I uh, learned from uh, experts uh, is that sometimes you have an increase, sometimes you have a decrease. It's not so 
systematic. But what you can be sure is that uh, uh, the more exercise you do to a certain level, uh, leisure exercise, uh, the best it is for your vascular aging. And uh, if you go to too much strenuous exercise, and for instance, in certain jobs, uh, it may have a deleterious effect. Mm. Uh, but also, uh, I am intrigued by, uh, uh, I followed, I'm following my pulse wave velocity every day with the uh, bathroom scale system for the last four months. And uh, I noticed that uh, after uh, strenuous exercise, or let's say 25, 30 kilometers walk, when it was possible some uh, months ago, uh, my pulse wave velocity went up. So there, 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 there should be some, uh, uh, after uh, an important exercise, a kind of uh, inflammatory uh, action on the muscles and on the vascular system, I do not know exact mechanism, uh, that finally uh, can offset the beneficial effect. But then, if you follow after the end of, the, uh, of this uh, uh, in acute inflammation, I do not know exactly how to name it, uh, uh, also velocity is reduced. On the long term, leisure activity physical activity is excellent for pulse wave velocity. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the acute inflammatory action of exercise, in my opinion, should be studied a little bit more than it has been done uh, until now. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Stefan. I know there were a couple more questions that we didn't get to, but I think in the interest of time, we'll have to bring the webinar to a close. So I'd like to thank you very much for giving up your time to present to us today. And um, we will be hosting future webinars every month um, until the end of the year. So we will be sending an email following this webinar with information on how to find out more. So thank you very much and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you to all of you and uh, stay safe. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye.